So today is our second week in our little mini-series on the sacraments, and today, of course, we're going to talk about baptism. We're pretty familiar with baptism, I assume, uh, what baptism does for us, why we baptize. At least that's something that, again, we all were taught in confirmation, and maybe we remember. So let's have a little refresher. Uh, First, we're just going to look at Luther's small catechism and what it says about baptism. The first question that Luther asks is, what is it? And he says, it is water enclosed in God's command and connected to God's word. Okay, that's great to know. What does it do? It brings forgiveness of sin, redeems from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe it as the words and promise of God declare. Wow, that's pretty impressive. How does water do that? This is... If you've read Luther's small catechism, it pretty much flows like that. I'm not exaggerating much. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not much. The water doesn't do it, but the word of God with and alongside the water and faith, which trust that this word of God in the water. What is the significance of baptism? It means the old creature in us with all sins and evil desires is to be drowned and die daily through daily contrition and repentance, and on the other hand, that that daily a new person is to come forth and rise up to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Baptism. Luther said it, I can sit down now. Except there's one problem. There's one question that Luther just kind of ignored, and it makes sense why he would ignore it, because in the time, the answer to the question was obvious. Who is baptism for? Luther completely ignores that question. And as Lutherans, we tend to forget that question too. We who baptize infants when they're infants. Most, I mean, the vast majority of us, I'm willing to bet, don't remember when we were baptized. There might be a picture. Uh, I know there's there's an adorable picture of me in a dress somewhere that my parents have because that was a thing when I was a kid. Everybody got a baptism dress. Well, see, and I do too. One, two, three. January 2nd, 1983. That's when I was baptized. So, but most of us don't think about that part. So we'd think, who is baptism for? Well, babies. Babies get baptized. Um, But interestingly enough, Jesus tells us exactly who it is that baptism is for in Matthew 28. The last thing he says to his disciples in the book of Matthew is, all right, you guys, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now you go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Go and make disciples of all nations. Who gets to be baptized? Everybody. Baptism is for all of us, but there's a big problem in what Jesus tells his disciples. Because Jesus just told his Jewish disciples to go and make disciples. Now, I don't know if any of you know how the process starts to become Jewish. But it starts with you going up to a rabbi and the rabbi telling you no. Over and over and over and over again. It is written in Jewish law that if you want to become a Jew, the rabbi that you talk to will actively turn you away from becoming a Jew. The whole point, of course, is to make sure that you are sincere and that you keep up with your wanting to become Jewish. But this kind of gives you an idea of how good Jewish people would be at going out and making disciples. Because in their instructions on how to make more Jews, it says, turn people away if they want to be Jewish. But then Jesus says, go out among all nations and preach the good news. Now, I can relate to being uncomfortable with sharing the good news with folk. I'm Lutheran. The Lutheran idea of making more disciples is have more children, or build a school. That's how Lutherans make disciples. So going out 
And teaching people about Jesus is something that we're just not super comfortable with. And it's interesting that when you look at what the disciples did after Jesus left, they started with the group of people they were most familiar with. On Pentecost, Peter stands up and starts preaching to a whole bunch of Jews who are in Jerusalem for the festival. He's preaching to people like him and saying, hey, I have met the Messiah, the Messiah that you've been waiting for. His name is Jesus. He died. He rose again. There's the good news. And then they find some more Jewish people to preach to. And then they find some more Jewish people to preach to. And then finally, round about Acts chapter 10, God's like, okay, y'all are doing really good about the preaching of the, to this one nation. How about you start doing a little bit better job at preaching to all the nations? And Peter gets the vision of the, all the animals in the sheet that gets lowered down a couple times. And God says what I have called clean, don't call unclean. And then some messengers from a centurion show up and say, hey, we want Peter to preach to us. And Peter's like, I can't go and preach to a centurion. And then he remembers, oh, I just had this vision. And then he goes and preaches to the centurion and his entire family starts speaking in tongues and prophesying and showing all the evidence that the Holy Spirit is there and they're Christians now. And then he has to go back home and spend the entirety of chapter 11 explaining why he had the audacity to go out and preach to some Gentiles. It's a really fascinating little thing that I just went through really fast. But it took him a while. But then Paul comes around. And Paul just starts, oh, I'm going to go to Turkey and preach to people there. I'm going to go to Ephesus and preach to people there. I'm going to go to Rome and preach to people there. I'm just going to go and preach to everybody. And Paul even went so far as to call himself the apostle to the Gentiles, as Peter was the apostle to the Jews. And Paul ends up writing later that in Christ, it really doesn't matter if you're a Greek or a Jew or Turkish or anything. Because in Christ, we're all one body. So all this difficulty coming from make disciples of all nations because there's not something they started out comfortable with. They got there, but it took them some practice. It took them going to people that they were comfortable with and starting there. And then maybe getting nudged a little bit outside of one's comfort zone. Um, it's usually not the best idea if you're not very good at talking about Jesus, to go somewhere that you're not comfortable anyways and start trying to talk about Jesus there. Uh, when I was on my internship, we took a group of high school kids from small town Iowa. And we took them to inner city Nashville. And they did not know what to do. They were so far outside of their comfort zone that the last thing on their mind was telling folk about Jesus. Because they were so uncomfortable where they were that they, didn't want, that they weren't about to make themselves more uncomfortable by doing evangelism. Because these were Lutheran teenagers and what are Lutherans bad at? Evangelism. But when you start out with, say, somebody closer to you, somebody who you see more regularly, it's a little bit easier to talk about Jesus. It's very easy for us to talk about Jesus in church, for instance, because that's a place that we're used to talking about Jesus. It's a little harder to talk to your neighbors about Jesus. It's a little harder in the grocery store, but we have these little rings. Um, but we're not used to that. We're used to people coming to us. We're used to having people just show up at church. But that's not what Jesus says. It's interesting that they always translate this, go make disciples. But if you actually look at what Jesus said, it's more like, as you're going, make disciples. As you're going, teach them to obey everything I commanded you. It's not something that is a special thing that they go and do. It's just, as you're going, as you're doing the things you always do, make disciples. As you're doing the things you always do, 
Teach them about Jesus. As you're doing the things that, all, that you always do, if somebody wants to be baptized, make it happen. Now, for a long time, the Christian church vastly misunderstood this command. They had a bad habit of basically between Charlemagne and the early Renaissance, for so, for, you know, we're talking about 500 years, their favorite way of making disciples was, I have a sword and there's a lake over there, get in, choose one. Do you want to be baptized or do you want the sword? Terrible situation. Even more terrible that when it first started happening, the church said, hey, maybe don't do that. But by the end of the time they were doing it, the church said, hey, good job, you converted a whole bunch of people. They misunderstood the whole go and make disciples thing. They took it to mean, go to this place, conquer them, and make them disciples. Where instead, Jesus just means, oh, you're going to Jericho today? Make a disciple. Oh, you're going to the market? Make a disciple. Because the thing that we sometimes forget about evangelism is it's not about the grand gestures. It's not about standing up on a street corner with a sign that says, Jesus loves you. It might be. You might be called to that. I don't know. But the thing about evangelism is it's something that we as Christians should just do because we should reflect Jesus as we go around. We should be reflecting Jesus and the things that Jesus has done for us as we walk out this building to wherever it is we go next. Because when it really comes down to it, what are Jesus' commands that we're supposed to teach people? He gave us two, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If those are Jesus' commands, are we showing ourselves to be good disciples? Are we showing ourselves to be the kind of disciple that someone else would want to be a disciple of Jesus? Because that's what's going on. The things that God gives us in baptism are pretty cool. And if we truly believe that these things that all boil down to God freeing us from sin, death, and the devil, if we truly believe that, is it obvious? When we go to the grocery store, can someone tell if we're a Christian? If we go out to eat for dinner, can someone tell that we're a Christian? It might not be something obvious. So let's boil it down a little more. If we, have, if we go out to dinner, are we showing Christ's love? In the grocery store, are we showing Christ's love? Here's the one I have a hard time with. As we're driving places, are we showing Christ's love? Because that's what Jesus is saying. As you go, make disciples. As you go, show people who I am. Because we live out the things that we experience in baptism. As Luther says, the old creature with, sin, with its sin dies daily. And the new creature is risen with Christ every day. That is what baptism is about. And so as we go about our lives, are we living in sin and death or are we living in life, in forgiveness? As we go, are we showing ourselves to be disciples of Christ in such a way that someone else might want to be a disciple? Because the message of God received through baptism is for all people. And Jesus says, as you go, make disciples.